Rich Gilmore. Good to see you. Thanks for joining. Uh, so I'll just do a quick introduction. And um, what the notion is to have a bit of a conversation and then uh, questions and answers from the class. So uh, that's what our agenda is. The, yeah, I guess, first question is, Rich, give us a little bit of a sense of your background and why you're in the carbon markets. Sure. Thanks, Charles. And uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, welcoming me to your class. I have a background that doesn't really make any sense unless you're doing this. Uh, so the first eight years of my career, I was a derivatives trader uh, working in the, in the futures market in Sydney. Then I worked for a big multinational packaging company in the circular economy for five years. Then I worked in uh, climate uh, science and conservation science for about five years. Then I opened and ran a highly fulfilling, highly unsuccessful social enterprise in East Timor, a, a, a accommodation business in East Timor that created jobs for local people. Then I worked with Charles at the Nature Conservancy for seven years doing climate finance and conservation finance deals. Uh, and then in, in 2020 and 2021, we've, we founded Carbon Growth Partners. So that's a, a kind of a very random background, but not so random when you think about it in the context of the carbon market. What we're trying to do is solve complex social, environmental, and climate problems using financial instruments. Um, and you need to know how to structure a deal and what things are worth and how to invest and what matters to communities uh, and what matters for biodiversity and, and conservation. Uh, and so, and what corporates want uh, and how to generate a return. So you bring all that sort of diverse background together and actually becomes, you know, quite handy in the, in the carbon market, which is still an emerging market. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. Solve complex problems using financial instruments. So uh, what was the, the sort of the single experience in your background that kind of led you this way? What, what's dry, what drives you? What, why are you doing this stuff? Um, I had what some people might call an epiphany, a, a single life-changing event in 2005. So I was working for a big packaging company. There were 11,000 employees. And of that 11,000, every year they sent 10 sort of high potential employees to go and do a volunteering experience completely unrelated to work uh, to make them a more sort of you know, rounded person and develop their leadership skills. I volunteered to spend two weeks volunteering on a mangrove restoration project in Kenya. Today, that would be called a blue carbon project, but that was this project happened before blue carbon was invented as a term. And so I spent two weeks on, a, on the mangrove project and it, I didn't care about mangroves. I just wanted the free trip to Africa. Um, but having spent two weeks there, something dawned on me, which was these incredible professionals, you know, uh, finance people, scientists, ecologists, community leaders could have been doing any job and earning any amount of money. And instead, they decided they chose to deploy their talents in the mud, solving other people's problems. And I thought, wow, what an amazing way to spend one's time. So I quit my job at the, at the box company, did a master's of environmental management, got a job with the organization that I'd volunteered with, and the rest is history. So a lot of these folks in the room are, are sort of at the stage you were uh, in terms of getting a, a master's in environmental management. That's just kind of what most of the group is here. There's a number of PhD students as well, but that's the general gist of it. What, um, what would you say you feel like in your career has, like you started off, you know, working in the mud in Kenya, have you ever had as big of a feeling of impact since then? <laughs> we did some really great things at the Nature Conservancy. We pulled off some amazing land conservation deals and and uh, Charles and I was working for Charles at the Nature Conservancy in 2017, like 2018. And we organized, we, we negotiated a deal that nobody who is, who's involved in that deal will ever do a deal this good again in their lives. Um, so we were able to negotiate the largest handback of, of land, of, of fee title land back to Aboriginal 
uh, people, First Nations people in Australia, the largest handbag of land in the history of Southern, Southern Australia. So 90,000 hectares, 100, 200, whatever that is, 225,000 acres of land to Aboriginal people. And it was $150 million worth of land and water that we secured at no cost. Um, and we're able to, to donate back to Aboriginal people. Ultimately, it was a the way the deal was structured. It was a market-based uh, deal. It wasn't um, a philanthropic deal. Um, but yeah, so there's been some really impactful things, but nothing that is going to move the needle as much as if we can get more climate finance moving faster to people and places that need it. So, so let's talk about that a little bit. This class is. I just uh, is climate finance in the carbon markets. What's the theory of carbon markets? Where did this idea come from? Uh, give us a little bit of that of your perspective on that. Because, and we've talked a fair bit about Australia and its unique role in carbon markets and going back and forth on that front. But talk to give us a little sense of like why carbon markets. What's what's the magic there? Yeah, it's a it's a really simple and elegant premise. So what may be difficult and expensive to achieve in one place may be less difficult uh, and expensive to achieve somewhere else. And so we should use the marginal cost of abatement to deliver more impact faster. So we should deliver the least cost abatement, deliver the maximum emissions reductions that we can uh, for the least investment is you know, economically, rationally, the way that you achieve the biggest impact faster, but it didn't start, uh, the market didn't start, or the marginal cost of abatement didn't start with, with carbon. It actually started with uh, sulfur dioxide and other atmospheric pollutants in the US um, in the 1990s, where uh, there was a cap on uh, sulfur uh, dioxide emissions uh, and then a tradable system where it's difficult to reduce those emissions from one form of industrial production in one place and that the, those emissions reductions could occur more readily and less expensively somewhere else. And then that system was adopted for carbon markets in the, in the 1990s. And we've been sort of, as you would have heard in the class, probably bumping around you know, in the carbon market for the last 25 years. We've managed to get from you know, uh, nothing to a few billion dollars of, of um, turnover annually. But if you were to add up all of the emissions reductions that have ever been achieved in every carbon market everywhere, you could offset global emissions for about two weeks. Um, and so you might think, well, all that effort for two weeks of emissions. But innovation is not linear. Um, this market has been building for a long time. And I think we're on the precipice of a really significant you know, exponential growth uh, to the upside. At least that's what, you know, most observers of the market would predict is going to happen. Long tail of market development, ready to, we think, significantly explode to the upside. So what, what's, so you've given us history yourself and then history of kind of the, the markets. What are you doing now? What is the fund uh, that you've started and um, how's it work? Feel free to, you know, you can use slides if you want. But yeah, I might, I, I might put if, a few slides. So the the reason we started the business and the fund was was for two reasons. We, you know, those the outcomes that we want. We want to see massive exponential growth in climate finance. We want to see more impact happen for more people and more places faster. But those things don't just happen. Real people in real places have to make them happen. Uh, and so we wanted to be one of those uh, organizations that helped make it happen. And for a couple of reasons, a uh, number of reasons, four uh, key reasons, we think that carbon credits, carbon markets are a very compelling investment opportunity. And to your point, Charles, I might just share my screen for a couple of slides to talk about why we think that's the case. And actually, I'll be able to tell when that's sharing. Yeah, there it is. I can see them. <laughs> I can see it behind you there. Um, <laughs> So we think carbon credits, carbon markets overall, are significantly mispriced. And they and I'll talk about by what, but they could be mispriced by in the in the international market where we're investing of 
so sometimes called the voluntary market, but not by us, um, they could be mispriced by a couple of orders of magnitude. Um, and so, you know, a hundred X price appreciation to the upside. And we'll talk about why we think that is possible. Um, but if you believe that carbon markets are significantly mispriced, you've got to be right about four things. You probably only have to be really right, right about one of these. Um, but we think all four of these things are observable now. So more investors will participate in this market. More large investors will start to see this as an investment opportunity and more capital will flow into the market and be competing for a constrained number of uh, assets. We think that there will be a discernible flight to quality. So that will mean that a number of lower quality credits in the market will become stranded assets that will diminish the pool of investable assets that's available. Of the investable assets of the carbon credit assets that are investable, the supply of those will continue to be constrained. And most importantly, the first among equals of these four is that there will be increased demand in particular from companies, but also from countries to offset their emissions using carbon markets. The reason a carbon credit has value, the reason it is has intrinsic demand is for its use, as I'm sure you know, as a carbon offset. A credit is purchased and retired and then used to make a net emissions reduction claim. So the intrinsic demand, the, the real driver of value in the market uh, is that demand from corporates. And so we can see on the investor participation, I won't speak to every slide in detail, there are billions and billions of dollars all being invested in the carbon market with the same thesis. If we're going to stay under 1.5 degrees of warming, that's very unlikely now. So let's say if we're going to stay under two degrees of warming, carbon credits have to rise and rise by multiples. We agree with that thesis. So rather than trying to always select which is the right technology, which is the right project, which is the right project partner, just buy the carbon, buy the physical asset, the carbon abatement that is derived from those, uh, those technologies and projects. You can see on this, Graph. This graph is a little bit uh, technical, but it shows the difference in price between high quality carbon credits, high quality forest carbon credits, and low quality forest carbon credits. When we launched the fund back in 2021, you can see at the very extreme left of this graph that there was no real difference between the value of a low quality credit and the value of a high quality credit. So the, the orange line is the difference in price between a low quality uh, uh, forest protection credit. The blue line is the difference in value between a forest restoration credit. So you can see that from 2022 to 2023, the spread between the value of a low quality credit and a high quality credit went from zero to between 200 and 1000 percent. So again, that's fewer high quality credits from fewer projects with more demand from companies to buy those higher quality uh, credits, and we think that will continue over time. This is a really interesting one. If you if you ask most market observers about the dynamic of the carbon market, they will tell you that the market is oversupplied, and that's because in any given day, month, or year, more carbon credits are currently being created than are being used for an emissions offset. So used used for carbon neutrality. So you know more supply into the, entering the market greater than demand for that credit means equals oversupply. I'll show you in a couple of slides why the carbon market is acutely and chronically undersupplied. But here we have a graph that shows issuances of carbon credit. So if we're gonna get to stay below two degrees of warming, we need to reduce carbon emissions, as you know, from 50 billion tonnes a year to zero. And we have to do that every year forever. So 50 billion tonnes a year. And at the moment, we're generating about 350 million, 300 million tonnes against a target of 50 billion. So in a market in a, or in an impact uh, sphere, well, we've got to increase uh, impact by, what, 160 times. So 16,000% increase is required. Last year, abatement of carbon credits went down not up. At the same time, you've got very steady offset demand. So last year, 
despite everything that happened in the global economy, the invasion of Ukraine, um, global energy insecurity, global inflation, fears of recession, that gave corporates an opportunity to walk back their commitments to say, not this year, it's too difficult, it's too expensive, it's too risky. And they didn't take that opportunity. They continued to buy and retire credits to meet their commitments. They didn't go up by much, but they didn't fall. And the number of companies that are making pledges, sitting behind those companies that are actually doing their offsetting now, is growing exponentially. And I mean that literally. The pace of, of, of growth is increasing. The number of, of companies that, that made a binding commitment under the Science-Based Targets Initiative in 2021 grew by 100%. Last year, it grew by 230%. And this year, it's growing by about 15% a month. They've got this massively increasing demand for carbon credits uh, from companies uh, that equals about somewhere between, I don't know, this is the low, the low percentile case here you can probably ignore. Let's say between four and eight billion tonnes a year just from companies. Not That's before any countries start offsetting their emissions. So you've got you know, 8 billion tonnes of demand from corporates, and we're currently able to generate a few hundred million tonnes a year. And yet, carbon prices are very low. Apologies for the formatting on this slide. So the reason that the market is mispriced, the reason that this, this, the fund that we're running, and I'll talk about how it works, um, is such a compelling opportunity in our view, is because the market is pricing uh, carbon supply and demand based on where we are today, here in 2023. But if you go out just a couple of years, and if you believe that corporate commitments are going to turn into corporate action, within just two years, you get into what's called, you know, annual supply exceeds annual, uh, annual demand exceeds annual supply. And then a couple of years after that, sometime between 2027 and 2030, you go into what is called negative inventory. And that means we've run out of carbon credits, We've sold and retired every carbon credit in existence, and we're generating new credits at a pace that is slower than the demand to retire them. And that is a, we, we believe that you should be long any asset where known demand is multiples of known supply. Uh, and that's what we think makes it a, a very compelling opportunity. I'm just going to pause there, Charles, before we get into the mechanics of the fund and ask if you have any clarifying questions that you think the class would benefit from yeah that so we've really i mean this is you can hear me okay yeah okay uh, yeah so questions around kind of the market conditions and and what rich has presented so far we haven't really touched on it i kind of glanced over it a little bit last week but what rich has done is really talked about pricing and dynamics of, of the market supply and demand any thoughts on that Rich, you mentioned it's a fifty billion dollar annual, um, or fifty billion ton annual emission, more or less globally, and just um, a couple of hundred million, three hundred million being retired uh, on an annual basis. So it's a it's a really uh, I'm not able to do that. Point point one five percent is that what that is? But it's about zero. It's about zero point three percent of the solution yeah. at the moment. So what's what's the um, What's the trajectory going forward? You know, you, you see the supply kind of scrambling to, to meet demand, or you know, what, what's the what do you see in the market on the on the on the project side? Yeah, great, great, great question. There's the carbon market won't be able to and isn't being asked to do the whole fifty billion. That's the size of the need. But let's say we can effectively, you know, decarbonize all the sectors of the economy that we. We know how to decarbonize and have imagined some technologies that we don't yet know how to decarbonize using. You're left with about somewhere between nine and 13 billion tons a year of residual emissions. That's if we can implement the technologies that we know about and invent new ones. Unfortunately, what's happening um, at the moment is capital is more expensive if you can get it. Projects are more expensive if you can, if you can uh, do them. Uh, and and the capital is very constrained. And so there will be fewer large scale investments being made. The, the capital expenditure intentions for big companies is, is significantly lower over the next five years than it was over the past five, even including 
the pandemic. And so you've got demand that's going to be pushed from direct decarbonisation into the carbon market. And that's going to require significantly more scale of projects. And let's say focus on nature-based solutions. Nature-based solutions are estimated to be able to do about a third of what we need to achieve in the residual carbon emissions production. So let's just say three or four billion tonnes a year can be delivered by nature-based credits, and we need to scale those up. The problem that we have, or which you know goes to the question of it being a, a um, good investment if you're thinking about the value of credits, many of the constraints to doing a carbon project can't be overcome with price. Even if the price of a carbon credit goes from $5 today to $100 tomorrow, that is not going to make one tree grow any faster. That's not going to speed up the soil carbon microbes process. It's not going to hasten good patient community development or policy rigor in a host country. And so the, the challenges that we have to scaling the market, including nature-based solutions, they're biophysical. They're to do with the growth rates of trees. They're about mobilization. Can you raise and deploy capital in, in least developed countries? Can you influence complementary uh, policy? And so we need to uh, massively expand this, the number and scale of projects that are being delivered into the market, but that's a non-trivial thing to do because of those constraints. Okay, so give us a sense. All right, what are you up to now? What's the what's the fun? How's it work? Who's investing? You know, what's the strategy? What's that? Sure, what's I'll just I'll go back to a bit more screen sharing because it's probably a little bit easy to show visually here. Um, one other thing I'd mention on price is prices are proving very resilient. So this is a this is a chart of the European carbon price in euros. The European Carbon Allowances. You may have talked about this uh, scheme already. Trading at 100 euros a ton. And in the past three years or so, there have been at least three significant pullbacks in the market of at least 30%. And every time, prices have recovered. And the reason for that is in carbon markets, rising prices are not just an organic function of supply and demand. Rising prices are explicit design features of carbon markets. Prices are intended to rise to incentivize decarbonization. And so in this case, the European market, that is achieved with putting a cap on emissions and having that cap steadily reducing over time without diminishing demand under the cap. So that forces uh, prices higher. Um, and we expect all prices to rise much higher again. So apologies for the formatting here. Just one, I'll just point out one uh, uh, data point here. On the very right-hand side of this chart is the price at which the European Central Bank um, says that carbon needs to get to by 2030 to stay under 1.5 degrees. So $300 a tonne is where the price needs to be. Companies are currently paying anywhere between one and $30 a ton, depending on the project. Uh, and so prices have to rise by somewhere between 10 and 300x um, to stay in, in uh, under 1.5 degrees. So how do you get up, how do you get access to that opportunity? Well, our fund has uh, multiple purposes. We're seeking to generate a 20% IRR for our investors and positive return, positive impacts for people and the planet. We're doing that by investing in both carbon credits, a portfolio of carbon credits, and carbon credit projects that are doing three things. So protecting and restoring nature. So rebuilding soil carbon, protecting mangroves, restoring forests uh, is, a, is a significant portion of our, of our investment. About half our portfolio is allocated to what are called nature-based solutions. The other half is allocated to what are called technology-based solutions you know, uh, clean alternatives to, um, to deforesting cook stoves, uh, renewable energy in least developed um, countries, uh, waste to energy projects capturing landfill gas. And by doing those projects, we're getting more uh, funding to projects that need it. We're generating returns for our investors. And importantly, we're delivering trusted offset solutions to companies that complement their internal emissions reductions. Carbon credits, carbon markets, carbon offsets are not an alternative 
to decarbonisation. We need to do everything everywhere all at once. And so as you're decarbonising your internal supply chain and your internal uh, processes, you buy and retire carbon credits as offsets as a complementary measure, not as an alternative measure. And so the way we get access to those projects, if you think about the carbon market as a continuum of impact, complexity, risk and reward, right down the very simplest end, the left-hand side of this chart, we buy credits at fixed prices from projects when they're issued. Carbon credits get issued to a project, we buy those credits, we on-sell those to a company who's going to use them uh, for emissions reduction purpose. We also do multi-year forward offtake. So we go to the project and we say, we'll buy not only your 2023 uh, credits, but we will forward to commit to buying your 2024s, 2025s and 2026s. Usually again, at fixed prices with some sort of indexation. We also provide project finance. So let's say we're gonna buy your 2023, 2024, 2025 credits. We'll give you 20 or 25% of the value of that contract up front to help you finance the project. So we're taking a little bit of project risk in order to get a better deal, get a lower price or more volume from a good quality uh, project. And then finally, we're doing what you might call brownfield or late stage origination. So we go to a project that's been operating for, I don't know, maybe three or four years, and it has one or two years to go before it's going to be <clears throat> issued any carbon credits and we complete the financing of that project. It could be through a joint venture, could be an equity investment or some other, some other structure. Um, and so we put <clears throat> project equity finance at risk to deliver uh, supply uh, into the fund at scale. What we haven't done yet is what's called greenfield origination. So brand new projects where you, you, you know, buy a piece of land and restore it from scratch to generate carbon credits. We're not doing those projects yet. They're very early stage. And then in the future, Two of the big things that we will be exploring is the enabling technologies, infrastructure that drives the market, the exchanges, platforms, uh, digital MRV uh, organizations, and really importantly, climate adaptation. Many of the most severe impacts of climate change are now inevitable. Uh, and we need to invest billions and trillions of dollars in food security, water security, and keeping people safe. So in one form or another, we're financing carbon credits or carbon projects. Those credits are issued into our, to our fund. And then the returns from the fund are generated in two ways. We trade those credits. So, you know, we, we make a margin by buying and selling credits, but principally from the long-term appreciation of high quality credits in the portfolio, which we believe are significantly mispriced and will deliver significant return to our investors over time as a result. I'll stop sharing again and, and pause for questions on the strategy. Yeah, I have a question on the type of investors that you have in your fund. You just mentioned like it's a very long term reason to, you know, the longer you wait, it seems those better and more value to just buy them and then, um, so then our types of investors are typically interested on in their investment horizons, like 30 year things. How do you, or are you also looking at like more short term? Yeah. Did you catch that question? I did. That's yeah. a good question. Um, it, and, and the unsatisfying answer is it depends. Um, and so if you're a long term institutional investor, let's say you're a pension fund. Um, and if, I, if you recruit a new employee who's just starting out in the workforce, you're going to be managing that person's money for 50 years. Um, and so you're really patient. And so those sort of investors are looking for, which we, which we don't have in our fund at the moment because they are too long term, but they're looking for, say, equity investments in projects that will deliver a royalty stream of credits over the next 10, 20, and 30 years. That's that's what they're looking for. The investors who are participating in the market so far, and including those in our funds, have a much shorter investment horizon. So um, we went to market and said, think about this as a three to seven year investment horizon when we launched the, the second fund in, in 2022. 
Um, and so, or even from now, so sort of three to seven years. And we're less than half the way into that first kind of three year window. And the reason we're saying three to seven years is because if we're not right by 2030, we're wrong um, the, on, the, on the thesis. The, the, and we're wrong about our ability to stay under 1.5 or 2 degrees as well. So the world has got to make very substantial progress on climate change by 2030 and very substantial uh, progress on, on carbon pricing by 2030 if we're going to have any hope of meeting the climate challenge. Uh, and so we've, we've, it's a three to seven year investment horizon. We just had our, um, with a two year lockup, so the investors have to commit for two years and then they can let them out. What has been very interesting is we're just coming up to our first window where investors can exit the fund. Um, and so far, and, the, and the, actually the first window has, has now closed. And despite all the volatility in the market, all the noise, all of the uncertainty and unfamiliarity, fewer than 20% of the investors in the first fund have decided to take their money out. So 80 plus percent are staying in, uh, despite this being quite a, a um, uh, novel and nascent and vol volatile market. The other thing I'd just say about the profile of the investors is it's changing um, quite quickly. In our very first time we ever raised capital, we raised that money from impatient um, impact and sort of VC-like investors who were very risk on, really got the thesis. So they were ultra high net worth individuals and single family offices where the founder was still alive. Just risk on, I get the thesis, you know, I, I want to be long carbon. The second time we raised money, it was more multifamily offices uh, and smaller institutions managing, you know, a couple of billion dollars and allocating five or 10 million to, to carbon markets. And now in the third uh, capital raise, it's much more private wealth managers uh, and mainstream institutions. And to us, that's a sign that the market is becoming more mature um, and is starting to attract more mainstream capital. It's a bit annoying for us because ultra high net worth individuals and single family offices don't read the docs. They just you know, sign the forms and send them in. Uh, whereas institutional investors spend months and months and months doing due diligence. Uh, so the trade-off for the larger, stickier um, investors uh, is the amount of, of time it takes to solicit um, and steward them through the due diligence process. Do, do, the, do the numbers a little bit on the, on the funds, and like how many projects, what's the tons that are, you know, you know what's the, how many investors, what's the numbers of, uh, in terms of the dollar figures that have been invested? Yep. Give us a sense of that. So we're managing about 160 million US dollars. This will give you a, a size of the scale of the market as well. We're managing about 160 million dollars, and and we have about 25 million tons of carbon credits in the portfolio. That's about five percent of all the carbon credits in existence, and more like 10 or 15 percent of the types of carbon credits. That would be in scope for the fund. So it's a non, uh, to not insignificant size relative to the market overall. What we hope is that the market, you know, expands very significantly, and that our and that our um, funds expand very significantly. But we can only grow at the pace the market grows. Otherwise, there's a risk that we become the market that we become over allocated, and there's not enough liquidity. Uh, and in that sort of 160 million, there's about 90 investors, I suppose, but like most capital cap tables, about 80% uh, of the capital has been invested by 15 or 20% of the investors. And so it's quite lumpy. There are investors who have tens of millions of dollars in there at the, at the biggest end, at the smallest end, a few hundred thousand dollars, or in some cases, a few tens of thousands of dollars, and actually not that many in the middle. You know, there's kind of a big gap between the, the multi-million dollar investors or the million plus investors, the sprinkling of people at the sort of half a million level, and then another big cohort at the hundred and two hundred thousand dollar level, which is not unusual when it comes to raising capital 
for projects like this or markets like this that are quite uh, that are quite nascent. Um, and as I said, the the profile of those investors is changing over time, moving from individuals and single family offices to mainstream uh, institutional investors. But they all want two things, a positive impact for the climate uh, and a 20% plus annual return on their investment. Other questions about the fund itself? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I'm wondering, I'm not quite sure if actually the amount will keep going up in the future. Like, I agree that in the short term, like, as, as you can see now, the companies are still very heavily depending on the carbon offset. But as you know, progressively, they are actually the switch to other kinds of like decarbonizing their, their, their supply chain or their operation, operation side, but not uh, that depends on the carbon offset. So, I'm wondering if. Actually, at a later time in long term, yeah, the the demand of on carbon credit is still that strong as now. So I'm not sure if the market will still work at the time when like the demand will become lower. And and we, question, we hope not. Um, yes. and so. Uh, and I have another question. Is I'm just a bit curious about like your composition on the fund on which kind of project, like whether the removal or the avoidance project that. You guys are more prefer on yep. because you know the for the avoidance project. I think that is more easy to do at the moment because it's usually uh, based on nature based solution and other kind of all the other things that we can actually do now. But for the remote project like carbon capture, those kind of very expensive fancy stuff, I I, I can see that as for more long term, more long term change. But I'm just wondering like. Funds you guys are running now is like support on which kind of sure. yeah. Right. Two excellent questions or multiple questions in there. Um, on the on the first one, um, we really hope so. We really hope that that in time our business becomes worthless because the carbon credits in the in the funds have become worthless because there's no demand because we've successfully decarbonized. That would make us happier than anything. But that is trillions of dollars and decades of time away from being a reality. Um, you know, how long is it going to take us to, you know, ev even the most bullish um, uh, assumptions for, you know, aviation fuels leave us with if, if the adoption of aviation fuels and more efficient fleet mapping and more efficient aircraft for av in, the, in the global aviation industry leave the airline industry short by about 3 billion tonnes uh, of emissions reductions by about 2035 in the best case technological scenario. Um, it's going to take a long time to decarbonise other hard to abate sectors. So there's as much as we would wish for there to be very significant demand destruction and demand destruction for carbon credits because we've successfully decarbonised, we are a long way from being able to achieve that. And you think about the amount of emissions reductions you can achieve using nature, for example. So nature can do, let's say a third of the emissions reduction challenge. Of that third, a third can be done for under $100 a ton. And of that third, a third can be done for under $10 a ton. And that's the projects that are being implemented now. Large scale forest protection projects with a low hanging fruit, they're being implemented now. So we hope you're right. We hope you're right that demand goes to zero because we've successfully decarbonized, but that's going to take a long time and cost a lot. In terms of the we are probably in the minority view at the moment, certainly for, for many in the market, about the critical importance of avoidance. As I said before, and as you would have heard the UN Secretary General Guterres say, we have to do everything everywhere all at once. And the number one thing that humans need to do to stay under two degrees is avoid emissions, reduce emissions. And technology-based reductions, uh, so you know, renewable energy projects, for example, are by definition permanent. If you can prove emissions reductions from a renewable energy technology, those, those emissions were avoided. And once avoided, 
were avoided forever. So technology-based emissions are uh, productions are permanent. If you just, and, but there is, you know, science-based targets and others would say that we need to do more removals or only removals. Only removals if you're using, if you're making a net zero claim. But if you only do removals, that's like trying to empty a bathtub with a spoon, but not turning off the tap. Uh, and so we have to do both reductions and removals. Having said all that and, and talked about the critical importance of, of you know, removals projects, we are heavily over uh, of reductions projects. We are heavily overweight removals in the fund relative to the market overall. Um, and so if you compare our portfolio to a, a, I guess, model portfolio of all the credits exist in the, in the carbon market, we have more removals credits uh, compared to the market overall. We have more credits from least to developed countries and less from India and China. We have less wind and solar and more methane. Um, we have less forest protection and more forest restoration. Um, we have less renewable energy and more cook stoves. For a range of reasons, we, we think that those credits not only deliver the most enduring climate impact, but they have the attributes um, that buyers in the future are going to care about. And even if we didn't care about removals or we didn't care about quality, we would care that the market cares. Uh, and the market cares about quality, the market cares about removals, uh, and we care about those things too. And so we're overweight those. So we have a diversified portfolio because we want to deliver appropriate risk-adjusted returns, not the highest absolute returns. We also want to deliver maximum impact. Uh, and so um, excellent question, diversified portfolio, overweight cook stoves, overweight removals, underweight red plus, underweight India and China would be the key characteristics of the portfolio composition. Is there another question? Did you? Yeah. My yeah, I mean, it's a bit more left field. Um, but you mentioned adaptation as something from the tail end of things you're looking at. And I was wondering, like, if these carbon credits are your sort of asset. So these are, this is, these are the assets you're holding. Uh, you need to maintain your value these assets. Do you look at adaptation as like a risk sort of matching tool or an edge or something? How do you, do you have to yourself buy insurance or other products so that it protects potential risk that you may face uh, to, you know, your own portfolio? You got that? You got a very smart class here, Charles. Yeah. <laughs> no, we, no, we don't, but we're thinking about it. So, the carbon market is already self-insured. So for every, um, say, depending on the project type, let's say for nature-based solutions, for every 100 credits that are issued, somewhere between 15 and 30 credits have to be contributed into the global disaster risk pool. The, it's called the buffer pool. There's about 300 and there's about 700 million carbon credits currently outstanding, I guess, issued into the market and not retired. And there's about 320 million in the buffer pool. So more than 40% of the total inventory of carbon credits is sitting in the disaster risk pool to self-insure the market in the event of, say, a natural disaster, or as the UN would call them these days, unnatural disasters. Uh, so a hurricane comes along, or a fire comes along or some other event comes along and destroys the carbon that is stored in a carbon project, then carbon credits are taken out of the disaster risk pool in re and retired. The way we're thinking about insurance at the project level is there are a few insurers who um, are now offering insurance policies for carbon project performance. We're not thinking about buying a policy to do that, but what we are uh, exploring doing and we've spoken to some investors in the US about is buying a portfolio of permanent reduction, so technology-based solutions to have our own disaster risk pool so that you can offer guaranteed abatement for forest carbon credits. So let's say that you get issued a million tonnes a year of forest carbon credits and those are worth $10 a tonne. 
you can also then buy a million tonnes uh, of, of avoidance credits, technology-based credits for $2 a tonne. Then your cost of production for your million tonnes a year is $12 a tonne to be able to go to a buyer, a big corporate, and say, under no circumstance will the climate uh, outcome that you've paid for not be achieved. Uh, doing it that way, the other reason for thinking about it doing it that way is, let's say the project performs really well uh, and 100% of the carbon, emission, carbon reduction outcomes from the forest carbon project that were pledged were achieved. You've now got a million tonnes a year of credits in your, in your self-insured pool that you have on the balance sheet as an asset that you can sell. So you just haven't paid away an insurance premium to a company. You've bought your own insurance uh, to sell guaranteed abatement. And then if the project performs well, you can on-sell those credits after an agreed period of time. So yes, excellent question. Uh, more and more threats to the permanence of nature-based um, projects in particular, ironically, driven by more extreme climate. Uh, and there are you know, multiple organisations trying to solve for that, um, I guess, non-performance risk using insurance. Other, other questions on, yeah. Uh, I think, is it possible to just turn this kind of fund into something more like uh, EPM or index fund so the public can participate in this market? Because I think um, more participation will increase the uh, like the financing of the project. Is it possible? Yeah, we, we, the, our funds are probably big enough to list now. Uh, and there are some index funds already. Um, the index funds in the verified carbon market or the voluntary carbon market, unfortunately, have performed terribly. Um, uh, we have outperformed the index fund in our market by at least 50%. Um, since inception. Uh, and the reason that those projects, those funds, those index funds have performed so badly is because they tr the only thing that they can track is the futures um, market. And the futures market, like all futures markets, is a lowest cost to deliver contract. So you get the lowest common denominator credits. You get the cheapest credits um, that are the ones that get delivered into that contract. And those are the credit types that project that investors are moving away from uh, as they start to focus more on quality. So you can create an ETF. It has been done. I think a better way to do it, if you want to make sure that you're investing in high quality credits, would be to just to list a fund like ours. So it's still an actively managed fund, not an ETF, it's not an index fund, but it's a diversified portfolio uh, of credits. But instead of being traded in the private markets, it's traded in the public markets. So we just list on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange or list on the Australian Stock Exchange would be the way to provide public access. I think I think it's too new for ETFs. Other questions? Um, I got we have I wanted to move into one final area because we're going to talk about it today. Uh, Rich, I, I, unless you had other chunks that you were... I could to... talk all day about carbon and the fund, uh, Charles, but um, as you know, but uh, if there's anything you think I should touch on, let me know. Uh, otherwise, happy to just yeah, uh, so, do verbal. So we're, we're, you know, we've looked at um, at the markets and the structure of the markets and how they work. Um, we're about to dive into projects. We started talking about projects and how they're created. Uh, yeah. The, the class is aware of, you know, uh, and and has started to look at some of the controversies around quality. You mentioned earlier in the presentation about the that you we we have we anticipated this flight to quality in the market, the focus on quality. Can you talk a little bit about um, the controversies in the in the carbon market? What where they yeah. came from? How 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 should we be thinking about them? How do you think yeah. about them, as a fund manager, and and how should yes. the public be thinking about them? Yeah, I might start that with the uh, unhelpfully by talking about what isn't happening. Um, and so it's really important to understand 
what's being criticised, what's being alleged in the controversies around uh, carbon credits and carbon markets, carbon offsets. What's not being alleged is that a project didn't achieve its stated goals, by and large. That does happen. Some projects perform, you know, worse than others. So, you know, there's forest fires or whatever. Um, but no one typically is alleging that a, a forest that had been paid to be protected wasn't protected or that trees that had been, you know, uh, financed to be replanted weren't replanted or that a wind farm that had been funded wasn't built. Those, all of those things are observable in real time at low cost now. What's being alleged is that having been proven, those carbon uh, outcomes are no longer either additional to business as usual, and the core tenet of the carbon market, as you would know by now, is additionality. But for the project, that climate outcome wouldn't have been achieved. Uh, so there's a question about you know, additionality. Would that project have happened anyway? And the other is the sort of somewhat arcane question around baselines. You've proven that your project successfully stopped deforestation. And there's been some reporting in The Guardian and elsewhere this year that you know, 90% of projects are, are you know, overclaiming uh, or the credits from those projects are low value or, or worthless. The research behind that article found that 100% of those projects successfully prevented deforestation. What's been called into question is the baseline that they used to compare the project uh, scenario, the success of the project, to with what's called the without project scenario. Without the project, what would have happened? And there's a bit of an arcane inside baseball accounting argument about how many emissions reductions were claimed. There's a very, I think, compelling school of thought that says, who cares? We need to pay people, pay indigenous communities, pay farmers, pay foresters to keep their forests standing. Uh, and so much of the controversy is around um, which baseline was used and how much, how many tonnes of abatement are being claimed for a project that has been proven to be successful, not whether that project was successful in avoiding deforestation. But that's what this market exists to do. The, this market needs licence to evolve and improve. So every five years or so, the... Um, the main standards and registries review their methodologies and re re review their eligibility. The most recent review from VERA, which is by far the largest uh, carbon standard globally, was in 2020. Well, it went from 2020 through to 2022. It's called VCS, Verified Carbon Standard 4.2. It eliminated about 50% of the global supply of carbon credits from generating new carbon credits by making ineligible grid-connected electricity in middle-income countries. So 50% of the supply of carbon credits historically has come from wind, solar, and hydro in Turkey, India, Brazil, and China. None of those projects or new projects in those places are now ineligible uh, to generate new credits. And that's the market doing its job. That's the market saying those credits are no longer additional and so they're no longer going to be no, no longer going to earn carbon credits. So 50% of the supply evaporates, um, you know, with a stroke of a pen. The same is currently happening with forest carbon projects. So the standards look at this on a rolling cycle, and this year they'll update the forest carbon methodologies to say, all right, so for these types of forest uh, protection credits, where historically you might have been able to claim 100 tons of emissions reductions. Now you can only claim 70, uh, for example. So methods evolve, standards evolve, the bar is always raised uh, to address those core concerns of additionality and overcrediting. But you know, we welcome the scrutiny, it's important, um, but some of it is just a bit ridiculous. Um, there's just some actors in the market or some observers of the market really who just don't think we should be using markets to solve common good problems, to solve the tragedy of the commons.
they would say that it's markets that got us into this mess. Markets can't get us out. Um, we have a different view to that, um, but a very strong view that, as I said before, carbon credits aren't the solution to every problem. They're the solution to some problems and they need to be done as part of a holistic decarbonisation strategy. That is super helpful. Um, could you, let's pause for a second though on, on additionality. We've just started to get into that notion and it's kind of a counterintuitive and difficult to kind of wrap your head around notion. Can you give us a couple of examples of what what does that mean? You know, if, if it's if it's additional, then you get carbon credits. If it's not additional, you don't. Can you sort of kind of play that out in some scenarios? Yeah, there, there was a great question before about removals versus avoidance. One of the things that's I think attractive to investors and companies in the if to removals is the accounting is very simple. You measure the carbon on day one. You measure the carbon on day 365. If it's gone up, you get paid. The end. Like, we're done. In avoidance, it unfortunately relies on an unobservable counterfactual. Um, what would have happened but for the project? And so one of, for renewable energy, often the key additionality criterion is what's called economic additionality. Uh, and so, for example, we are investing in some biogas projects in Turkey at the moment. Uh, and uh, what that project has to prove is they have a plan to build a biogas plant that's going to uh, create methane and feed energy into the grid by diverting animal effluent from rivers. So what they have to prove, um, it, and it's again, it's a little bit arcane, depending on which assumptions you use for the cost of capital. They have to be able to prove that in order to get that plant funded and to profitably operate and generate an uh, investment return that is appropriate for the risk that's being taken for that project type in Turkey, the carbon revenues being generated by the project, so the sale of the carbon credits that that form part of the capital returns for that project were essential to getting that project funded and built. If you can successfully build a biogas plant in Turkey and generate adequate returns from just selling the energy into the grid, then you won't be issued carbon credits. Or if you are issued carbon credits, there is a risk of non-additionality. And so there's a little bit of subjectivity that introduces some subjectivity because you have to make an assessment about what an investor's risk appetite is for investing in a biogas plant in Turkey. Um, and so that's repeated for, you know, for renewable energy in solar energy in India or in Mali or wherever. And in forest carbon, you have to prove as I'm sure you'll talk about with the uh, Red Plus uh, program, that at the point of the, pro at the forest being protected, that forest was under imminent and observable threat, uh, threat of loss. And you have to be able to identify that source of that threat, spatially define uh, the area that's under threat, and then choose a reference area where you can show that threat in action. A similar project area in a similar geography being de deforested at a certain rate to back up that, but for the project, that's what would be happening in your project area. Um, so it's all, I liked it before you said, it's all a bit funky, uh, some of it, but this um, unobservable counterfactual of the without project scenario uh, is, the key test of any avoidance project in the carbon market. Yeah, it's it's interesting because it's um, you know, the carbon market is really a, meant to subsidize and and drive investment in carbon removal uh, and, and carbon you know extraction, carbon activities, you know, generally good carbon stuff that happens, and to also price carbon into the bottom line of, of the corporate sector, right? So it has those two goals to it. And like any sort of subsidy program, uh, it has rules attached to it. But there are very few subsidy programs out there that 
have this high enough, this high bar of additionality, right? This kind of counterfactual world where you have to prove this but for cause that causation. Um, is that something that's going to weaken or tighten over time? Um, what do you reckon? I think I think the there will be more noise from the noisy clown car of people who criticize the market for another I don't know how long, six or twelve months, maybe until after maybe until after COP twenty eight in Dubai, uh, when the you know rules for integration of the international carbon markets and with the compliance markets are, are better settled. So I think there's a little bit more noise to come, but I think the overwhelming uh, uh, driver is going to be the climate itself and that we need to do much more faster and that carbon markets are an essential part of getting to that transition and getting to net zero. So I think where we'll end up with, which is where we're starting to end up already, is that carbon markets are essential. They've got to have high integrity, but let's not let the perfect you know, be the enemy of the good, to, to quote the cliche. So probably more noise to come. Uh, and then I think we, you know, swing into a, you know, not no, but how uh, sort of dynamic or narrative. All right, other, other questions? I had one more I wanted you to get into, but anybody, anybody? Well, while, uh, you're, while you're seeking questions there, Charles, the subsidy thing is, is an interesting one. Most subsidies are for highly destructive activities. We spend much more subsidizing fossil fuels annually than it would cost us to fix climate change, like m multiples. You know, we spend about $6 trillion. What's that? You know, 9%, maybe 8% of GDP subsidizing the problem. Carbon markets subsidize the solution. If we spend 1% of the time that we spend criticizing carbon markets, criticizing fossil fuel subsidies, we'd be done by now. <laughs> no. Well, that's kind of where I wanted to go is, is the corporate side. Uh, so the last, we, we've got, I think, three more classes after this, and we're going to talk about projects and uh, uh, red projects and, and other kinds of projects. But then we're going to really get into corporates and, and how they're thinking about the world. And, and what is what do you think corporates are supposed to be doing? How should they be thinking about this? You know, you've got a, you know, let's say Telstra, uh, Australian telecommunications company, very conscious of its, of its carbon uh, footprint has taken a number of actions. Are they doing enough? Or what's 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 your view of like? Yeah, they, I, I think they are. They're, they're doing a great job. They're they're in the top ten of um, carbon credit offset companies globally in terms of volume. They are nowhere near the top ten biggest companies. Um, and so typically, there's an idea in the carbon market of and and other you know like biodiversity action, for example, you know, or even other uh, social causes, mental health, you know, um, you know, homelessness. It's called the mitigation hierarchy. And, you know, avoid your emissions first, avoid the negative impact first, and then reduce and replace. And then finally, after you've done all that, only then offset what's, what's left over. That is completely backwards. Every company should be paying compensation for every ton of emissions that they that they emit right now. And so you offset, you should be, like Telstra is doing, offset everything always now. And then as you successfully decarbonize, uh, you need fewer and fewer offsets every year. Rather than doing your best and then 15 years from now, finally getting around to paying some compensation for what's left over because you've you know, completed what you can internally. So Telstra, the biggest source of their emissions are all the fossil fuel powered generators, the diesel generators that power their phone, mobile phone towers across regional remote Australia. There are thousands and thousands of phone towers in Australia that are powered by diesel generators. So Telstra is offsetting all of its uh, emissions always, starting from a few years ago, and is also progressively 
rolling out a, a, a program to replace those diesel generators with electrical uh, alternatives with battery backup, solar uh, alternatives with battery backup. That's exactly how companies should be doing it. They should be offsetting everything now uh, and then have a diminishing offset liability over time. And one of the criticisms in the market we have to get away from is that it is too cheap for companies to, to buy offsets. It is, it's definitely too cheap. But what we're trying to achieve, what we should be trying to achieve is normalizing the behavior of companies paying compensation for their offsets. So, and if you do that when prices are low, it might be costing Telstra, it would be costing them maybe at the moment, $10 million a year to be carbon neutral. Not a not insignificant sum, but you know they can afford it and they pass on the cost to customers. We want companies, we want to normalize that behavior where companies offset their emissions, even while it's cheap. And then that becomes the social norm, the behavioral norm, the corporate norm. And then as prices rise, the penalty for, comp for pollution becomes higher. The incentive to, to decarbonize becomes stronger and action accelerates. If you don't get them in the door while prices are cheap, you're missing that you know, early accelerant that could be speeding up the development of so many projects. You know, If we don't buy now, we'll pay later. All right, buy now or pay later. Um, I think we can wrap up with that. Are there any other questions anybody else have for Rich before we take a little break? Hey, oh yeah, one more, good. Uh, yeah, so you mentioned that um, the carbon offset should be more of a supplementary, should be more of sub, uh, complementary na nature. And um, do you think that a compliance carbon market would be a um, better choice uh, in terms of achieving the goals that you just mentioned about uh, normalizing the uh, normalizing the, the, the thing that companies pay for what they uh, what they have um, uh, pay for the damage that they have created to the environment. Do you think a compliance market should be working in tandem with the voluntary carbon market? Yes, a hundred percent. They should be more interoperable and will be. Uh, so the Singapore carbon tax will be allowing voluntary carbon markets. The Australian carbon credit unit system is a hybrid uh, compliance and voluntary uh, system. The thing about compliance markets, though, is, you know, we say, oh, well, compliance markets are, are better than, you know, uh, voluntary markets because they force decarbonisation. They don't. Compliance markets still rely on a theory of change that says rather than, than um, you know, pay the tax, the company will choose to decarbonize. But that's still just a theory of change. The, the option is open there for the company to buy an allowance and not reduce their emissions. Um, and so that, that aside, yes, I think it's really important that the, what the compliance markets provide is stickiness of demand, so stickiness of the commitments. They take away the, the discretion to participate in the carbon market, but they never go far enough. You know, they capture, you know, single or double figure percents of total emissions. Um, where we should be trying to get to is compliance markets playing that function, forced participation for a certain percentage of emissions, and then socially forced participation in the voluntary market take those emissions reductions from 20% or whatever the compliance market is to 100%. Net zero by 2050 doesn't cut it. We need net zero now. And the way you get there fast uh, is through carbon markets. So everything, everywhere, all at once is the, uh, is the answer. Yes, starting now. <laughs> Start right now. Great. All right, Rich, thanks so much. Awesome to, to have you kind of walk us through that and, and, the, and the fun and, and, the, and the philosophy behind it. I think one of the interest, you know, really interesting pieces was you turned this sort of hierarchy on its, on it, or, or conventional wisdom on its head that essentially companies should go and decarbonize their activities, change the light bulbs, et cetera, first, 
And then only after they figured out all that, they should go and and uh, and and offset their carbon. You're basically saying, no, that's that's absolutely the wrong way to do it because you basically need to get them in the habit of having to pay for and price the carbon in, and that will also drive faster decarbonization. Uh, you don't really want to give companies the excuse to delay. Is essentially what you're saying here. Which yeah, I think exactly. Okay, cool. Um, super helpful, and thanks for staying up late. I know uh, it's My pleasure. late in Australia. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.